we can have it. We can, we can take it. So, um, um, good afternoon, everyone. The uh, lack of sound makes it really easier to be here. Um, so, I'd like to welcome you all to uh, to this evening to the uh, uh, fifth, uh, fourth um, lecture in the series, um, and just a couple of housekeeping bits before uh, any further. Um, the initial notice that went out said that there was going to be a lecture next Tuesday night at 6 and um, that was revised in the Irish Psychologist so it's actually the following Tuesday the 12th so not next Tuesday Tuesday after that but we sent people out a reminder tomorrow from here um, and that's me who's, who's, who's giving that um, and at that um, so at the last uh, lecture and um, uh, we may try and email you in advance if, you, if you're not going to be here we'd like to do some sort of evaluation just to kind of uh, how do you find the series that kind of uh, you know uh, customer satisfaction kind of piece um, so, so we we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get on to you about that um, I'd like to, to welcome um, very sincerely uh, Dr Susan Delaney Susan is the uh, manager of the uh, bereavement services at the Irish Hospice Foundation that's the right title Susan mm-hmm. um, and um, Susan's here tonight to talk about um, the identification, management, treatment of complicated or prolonged grief. Um, and I, I have to say, I think Susan is another example of um, uh, incredible uh, wisdom and insight and competency that we have uh, in, uh, on the island, uh, but don't always recognise or don't always put forward. So. Um, I, we're, we're very lucky to hear um, what Susan has to say about prolonged uh, and complicated grief. Um, one of the um, Su- Susan certainly for for me over the years has been um, has been a bit of a mentor um, in terms of uh, navigating uh, the, the the world of bereavement, loss, trauma, and um, and I mean this with absolute respect. Has, has done that with a real uh, wisdom and insight and practicality. Um, and uh, uh, wisdom, insight, practicality, and a tenderness, it needs to be said. And I think that's some of what you're going to hear tonight. So, so that's, that's um, probably enough from me. Um, enjoy. Susan, after all that. I don't think I can do that at all. I think I leave now. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everybody. Good evening. I think I've met some of the people here for the first time tonight in the series. Few. Well, you're particularly welcome. But nice to see people coming back as well. That we didn't scare you off. Um, I left out handouts of, of my PowerPoints tonight simply because I know if I'm at something, I like to have them where I can write a few notes on them. Having said that, I'm a little bit precious about them in that, and I'll tell you as we go along, some of them, actually the the fancier ones, don't belong to me. They belong to Dr. Cathy Shear, who came and did some training for us last year and very kindly said we could use her slides for training purposes, which is covered in this, but not for for duplicating on beyond here. So I only have to ask you um, at your discretion to, to not do that. Um, but if it helps you in terms of following along what I'm doing, that's grand. I also brought along some of Ursula's from last week if people were here and wanted them. There was about 10 there, but we could do more if you want. Uh, again, I realise it's just maybe people want to have them. I had said to people they could email me uh, and I'll send them on. And Ursula has sent them to me in soft copy, so certainly I'm expecting people that aren't here tonight will do that. But if you were here last week and you'd like to have Ursula's, um, you're very welcome to take them. Um, my piece tonight I suppose in some ways is, is a follow on from what Helen did and then Ursula around the, the models of bereavement that Helen presented and then Ursula spoke very well I thought last week around how do we contain bereavement, how do we work with bereaved people I'd like to take that sort of a step further tonight um, and present a little bit just around complicated grief and you'll have heard the terms complicated and prolonged grief and we'll get to that too. Um, So just having a look at what it is, if it's anything at all, 
uh, and how we might work with it because I think there's some quite interesting research around that. I'd like to also spend a little bit of time at the end um, just throwing out what, what is happening around the new DSM vis-a-vis -vis bereavement and some of you may know that or not but I hope people will have comments on it. Um, nothing that psychologists like better than a good row and there's been lots of rows um, about bereavement and the, the over medicalization I suppose of emotional difficulties and can you not just be shy do you always have to have social anxiety or do you know so forth and that, that has played out in bereavement and there's a couple of things um, up for grabs nothing decided yet um, but certainly not too late to have uh, to, to voice your opinion on it and it just struck me if we had a bit of time it would be interesting to see what people think here because um, I find myself quite torn there's people whose, whose work I really respect have come down on different sides of the camp so we'll have a look at that too um, I want to start with I, I suppose just a, a little bit of baseline stuff I just I suppose it's a laying out of my stall of what do I believe to, to be true about bereavement um, and, and you'll hear me during the night, I, I do certainly draw from my clinical practice. I see, um, I have a clinical practice solely made up of people presenting with complicated bereavement in, in the hospice. Um, and I suppose that those are the people I've learned from. Um, and, I, and I do use that when I'm teaching. I change it, obviously, but, but it just, it, it's always worth saying around confidentiality. If I'm specifically given a bit and you think, oh, I think I know that person hand on my heart then I've asked that client for permission and I do that quite a lot but they, they teach you great things and I'd say do you mind if I use that teaching it really um, illustrates a point but I, I you know I change bits as well so but I think that's important and 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 anything that I use from a client perspective in that way is for training and God knows Ireland is a small place so training means in this room and not beyond this room and I do know that you know that and I don't mean to be preaching to you but I think that always needs to be said I think we need to always hold uh, that confidentiality very clearly excuse me very clearly okay where to start um, you know this and I gave it to you on the handout nothing, nothing new in it but it kind of gives us a chuckle um, and I think it's just a reminder to us that this is a very difficult area I, I know sometimes and I forget I'm steeped in it this is the work I do every day um, but can we can we just take that moment to remind ourselves that we are not comfortable around death when Ursula asked last week around what made this work particularly difficult I suppose the other thing I would add into that is that it's difficult because it breaks through our own very natural death denial or death terror as, as Becker would say and that's worth considering when you're doing the work and even sitting here tonight being aware of what gets activated in you uh, I worked for years in the rape crisis centre with people who had been sexually abused as children now that's very safe work by comparison because I wasn't sexually abused as a child you know when you're sitting eyeballing a bereaved person you are that person there's, you know, there's, nothing, there's nothing to say you're sitting in one chair versus the other chair uh, and, and as you know ultimately any time we're trying to heal others it's always about trying to heal ourselves yeah but no more so than in bereavement and it's it's never a matter that we don't know about loss when we have young students sometimes training and they say no we haven't we haven't come to loss yet we haven't done we haven't done death and dying yet I say well you better hurry up because I don't know what counseling is about if it's not about loss and we grieve not just what we've had and lost we also grieve what what we hoped to have and never had and those kind of disenfranchised losses those hidden losses aren't always so obvious but the older I've gotten the more I realise that that really I, I, I challenge me but I don't know what counselling is about or what people come for other than life just not working out the way I expected and all those losses ok so in this area what is it that gets activated for us when we work with bereaved people it very clearly it can remind us of something that happened to ourselves so we're bringing all of ourselves to the work if it hasn't happened to us yet it can raise that piece of us of thinking ooh what if that was my mother sister brother yeah and they can be unexpected I had somebody coming in to, to, to do a little bit of teaching for me one day someone who, whose child had died 
and I was just kind of buzzing around doing my bit and she, she started to talk, it was a mum and she said I have two children called and she mentioned the names and they were the same names as my two children and, and those kind of sides swipe you and I thought well the next thing she's going to say is which of those children died and, and I don't want to hear it no, just the fact it was the same name doesn't mean anything it was very close, very close to the bone all of a sudden and then ultimately it confronts our own death denial and don't underestimate that we use up a certain amount of psychic energy all the time trying to keep that death denial at bay because really we, would we get out of bed in the morning if we had it in our minds that we were all going to be dead and everyone belonging to us uh, we have to all the time hold that tension between finding meaning in life and being aware that life is going to end and how do we do that um, that's part, part of what I believe to be true two more bits to go Without, without naming it, you know, psychologists just love charts. Okay. Anyway, without naming it, this is roughly um, a chart that's put up by a bereavement support group. So along the bottom there you have just time. Um, I'm playing a little bit fast and loose, but it looks something like this. Three months to two years with a bereaved population. Okay, and let's just say a distress level. So a chart like this was put out to say, we've audited our services, this is how we know we're providing an effective service. Bereaved people came in and they, here's where their distress level was. Um, they, they got bereavement support from our organization and this is where they are now. <coughs> so we are providing effective bereavement support. Yeah? True? No? Anything missing? Life in general. <laughs> <laughs> so you can say more. I can't tell you how many times I've shown that in groups and people. Come on. We know in our psychology training. Where's the control group? Where's the control group? I think Shut has done quite a lot of work in this. Um, and, and when you look at a control group, you can expect it will follow a very, you know, whatever but a very similar trajectory but this is missing and I'm telling you private practices are full of brief time and they come and they come every week and they pay they pay anything you want and they show up and they'll be marvellous yeah and um, at what point does that become an ethical issue for psychologists exactly what would have happened if they hadn't received breathing support and what we know is the vast majority of people find their way People have been bereaved for a lot longer than there's been psychology and counselling. Do not assume we are the uh, change agents in this. But I've been there and trying to say, I couldn't have done it without you, you saved my life. <coughs> <coughs> Thanks very much. Thanks. Seriously? Come on. Come on. At best, I would suggest to you, we are a sling. We're like a sling. Someone has a broken arm. What does the sling do? It holds the arm in place. The sling doesn't heal the arm. Yeah? The body heals the arm. The sling merely holds it in place. And, and, and I think also provides a bit of a visual. It says, you know, mind my arm. Mind my arm. But the arm heals the arm. Right? So we need to be cautious in, a, in taking too much, too much credit for what indeed is no more than how we are hardwired. Does that make sense to people? I think we miss it. I, my whole practice is people who are not following this trajectory. So if that's true for any of you, then you're seeing a skewed sample. You're seeing the people that are having difficulty in their life, not the people who are doing exactly what they need to be doing. Most people find their way through their life. Thank you very much. They don't need us. A lot of research to suggest we have no business dealing with these people. And again, I'd suggest, at when does it become an ethical issue? If people are having an on-time bereavement, if they have adequate support, there is actually very little role for a formal intervention. And certainly Heng Schutz's work, if you're familiar with, would suggest that in fact it might be harmful to get involved with a natural bereavement. If for no other reason than the neighbours, colleagues, family, step back because we'd all prefer not to be doing it anyway so if they're seeing someone professionally it gives us lots of 
permission to step out and not go visiting. But don't you hate doing those visits? I hate it worse than anything because I'm a breathing services manager. People think I'm going to come up with something brilliant. I'm supposed to come up with something really good at funerals and breathing visits. And what do you say? I'm sorry for your trouble. What else is there to say? We really should have no truck with these people. And, and I suppose it, that's a message I, I bang on about a lot because I do think um, our, our formal, what we call like level three services, formal psychotherapy, um, gets full up with people who, who are terribly sad and terribly distraught over bereavement. But does that mean they need psychotherapy? How are we so sure they need it? So it's a little bit of a rant, but I think it's important. I'm really only just putting out where I'm coming from, but well backed up by research to suggest if someone is having a normal bereavement, and we'll talk about what that means, um, we should very carefully consider whether we have any business having anything to do with them. But it's a challenge to someone in private practice. Are you going to say to someone, I can hear you're very sad and you're bereaved and you miss John, but I think you're doing okay. That's the challenge. You can argue with me. My husband says, Susan, you always sound so definite, and yet you're so frequently wrong. <laughs> so, I kind of know what he means. I'm not, this is bereavement according to Susan. Don't feel you have to agree. I love an argument. Uh, so it's, I, I'm really only telling you from, from my point of view. Now, the last piece in terms of putting out my stall is where do you meet a bereaved person? Ursula did a lovely piece for those of you who were here last week around containers and it, it reminded me of the containers I use, uh, the balls and the jars, people might know it. Um, this is not written up in any peer-reviewed journal but it, it certainly is what I use with clients um, borrowed from Barbara Monroe in St. Christopher's Hospice. There's a push-pull I find in working with bereaved people um, as helpers and carers, of course we want people to be feeling better, doing better, if for no other reason than it helps us feel better about what we do. Um, when you're working with bereaved people, they're not really that keen on getting better. Because what does be getting better mean? Mm. You know, it is a very funny kind of a push pull. They feel just slow, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, and it's different in that way from any other presentation, I think. And it can be hard to, to think, well, why would somebody want to, to hold on to such difficult memories or difficult times? Because it's what connects them to the person that died. But we need to be very cautious of not setting up a kind of a push-pull as we're trying to, to move them along, and they're saying, not really, you're not going anywhere. Uh, and that can be a very stuck place. Um, I've had some success with this and I offer it to you as you like. If we say to people I call this the, the, the influenza model that's, that's actually a ball squashed in there. And kind of as a visual if you think that's how it feels when you're just bereaved. You're just bereaved, that's it. And if you've had that experience yourself you might know it. There's no space for anything else. Nothing else matters. The world seems kind of stupid. You know Auden's poem about stopping the clock. What? What's everyone on about? It doesn't matter anymore. I am just bereaved. I am the woman whose son died. The man whose wife died. That's, that's how I identify myself. Okay? If we stick with the influenza model and think, don't wake up and you think, oh, jeez, I'm dying with the flu. And you just think you'll never get over it. But if you hang in there, the flu, if the flu is the ball, starts getting less. Yeah? And if you hang in there a week more, Maybe you still have a sniffle, but it's kind of going. Let me put them on something. Can you see them there? Okay. So it kind of works in flu. You could, you could continue on another couple. And should, before you know it, you'll be back to your old self. Right? You're now over the flu. If you are the jar and the ball is the illness, that's flu. We try to impose that as a model on bereavement, and it doesn't work. And the linear model that suggests at some point you'll be back to your old self. Any brief person will tell you there's no going back. What are you going back to? You are changed forever by a significant bereavement. But any model where people are kind of like, are you alright? Are you over it? Are you back at work? You know, just move along as if the grief is getting less. And I think as service providers, we are sometimes guilty of this. And this is sometimes our sort of contract in our head 
to where they're not as upset or not as whatever it might be so the grief is less but look at the scariness for a bereaved person of thinking if this continues if this is the grief if the ball is the grief at some point I won't remember that person anymore they will be forgotten and the terror the day people wake up and say I can't actually remember his voice or I can't bring her face to mind yeah so we need to be cautious as service providers you know that we're not falling into this kind of a model and we do not have an agreed contract if this is what we're working towards so if we call that the flu model and then you can see it the other way this involves using a lot of people so we start, start in the same place yeah okay acute grief that's where we start this is the same person the same ball all that can change the jar has got bigger and bigger and you could have a progression along there very frequently I bring these in the first time I meet someone and say could we have a contract around this if this was our last session what would be different can we have a point of agreement here that says you will always remember Mary John will always be central in your life the grief may not change. I don't know. Will it be better at Christmas? Will it be better in two? When will it be better? I don't know. Grief has its own trajectory. But if we can work on it, I can help you. Can we work on it so there's more to you? So there's space for things other than just the bereavement. Can you reconnect to those other parts of yourself? So you're not just the woman who's so died or the man who's wiped out. What else can you see? And this is moving more towards the dual process model I put up again that um, Ursula and, and Helen talked about. Um, what else needs to be in there? So another way you can say it is to say to people, look, it's not that the grief gets lighter, it's that the shoulders get stronger. But that's the starting point of thinking, do we have a buy-in there? Because if not, what, what are we doing? No point. So, for what it's worth, it belongs to Barbara but use it if you find it helpful. Okay. Uh, always the place to start. Does anyone have a thought about that coming in? Can we actually have a conversation around isn't every bereavement complicated? What do we mean? What's the opposite of complicated? Are we saying it's simple? If you've been through it, it's certainly not simple. My dad died at 81 after a life-limiting illness. He had quite a nice death, as deaths go. But it wasn't simple for all kinds of reasons. Do you think there's such a thing? This complicated grief. Go on, put up your hands. Who thinks there is? Okay, who thinks there isn't? Or doesn't know? Or has no opinion. <laughs> How are you voting on Thursday? When you were talking yeah. about all the, all the supports that people have in their lives, yes. what I found is that adults, particularly women, seem to generally find it a bit easier to talk to their friends about it and mm-hmm. talk to family members about it. Mm-hmm. But teenagers regularly mm-hmm. would say, um, I don't want to talk to my friends about it because I'm sure they're sick of listening to me. Mm-hmm. 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 So a mitigating factor for complicated grief is social support. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. But it's a very tricky thing, and I'm delighted not everyone put up their hands because it, I mean it is far from sorted. Uh, I might have given you a clue when I said my whole clinical practice is people with complicated <laughs> bereavement. So uh, I clearly come down on one side. Um, Ursula made an observation last week for those of you that were here around people self-select. And it, it, it has proved to be quite a, a strong um, criterion, if that's the word I mean. That people are quite good at diagnosing themselves, of saying, everybody else seems to be getting on with it, but I'm not, or there's something different. Yeah? I'm very keen on the kind of the man on the bus and, and what do people say, because, because of our own death terror and because we know it impacts all of us, we all have very strong opinions. I usually beat them out of students by the time we're finished. They decide they know nothing about it. But we start off with very strong opinions. And you'll hear people say things at funerals like saying, 
I didn't like the look of him at all, Mary. I don't think he's doing well at all, right? She never stopped crying. My God, you know, we make judgments. We make judgments around it. Um, I was on the bus one day. Some of you mightn't remember Hugh Coveney, TD that died in Cork many years ago. Um, obviously, I'm from Cork. Uh, and his wife, Pauline, we married, I think, maybe about a year, 18 months after Hugh died. And there was two old ones on the bus and said, I see Pauline remarried. Yep. Didn't take her long. Now, what do you hear in that? There's a judgment, yeah. So, so it's written somewhere or somewhere that I don't know. How long? How long is enough? I frequently get referrals, and they they could go something like. Mary goes to the grave three times a day. Complicated grief question. Please see ASAP. And I could pick up the next one, and I might say. Joan has never been to the grave. Complicated grief. Please see ASAP. But isn't it interesting? It makes you think. How many times are you allowed to go? How long do you have to wait before you get into another relationship? So we do have judgments about bereavement Mm -hmm. and when it's going along a normal trajectory, which of course usually means how we would do it or how we have done it. But what are we basing it on? One of the most controversial things that's come out of the the complicated grief literature is that it can be diagnosed at six months, before six months, post-death. Now, that's been quite a stunning and very contentious finding. Even if you you kind of run that through your own, you know, stay with your practice wisdom, but don't lose the common, common sense bit either. I think a lot of us in the area have kind of would have gone along with the idea, well, you'd at least need to give people a year to see how they go and to go through all the firsts and the first anniversary, and then we'd be having a look at it. But some of the research would very strongly suggest that we could be picking it up much earlier. And that's very important. Because if we were to do uh, something similar, let's assume this is... um, and on time bereavement, for want of a better term, if we looked at somebody presenting with a complicated grief, you'll get something up here. Whether or not they have treatment. Some people have described it as the difference between giving up water and cigarettes. People presenting with a complicated grief tend to either stay the same or get worse. They don't, in fact, improve with time. They don't improve with bereavement support, empathetic listening, Rogerian style counselling, very um, client centred kind of counselling, which for many of us are are tenants that we hold very dear. And how does that gel with the belief that people are self actualising and move towards help themselves? People get very stuck in complicated grief. And we do need to, to, to look to the evidence to see. How do we need to be diagnosing them? When can we diagnose them? And what do we need to be doing about it? How are we doing so far? Anyone who doesn't think there there is such a thing as complicated grief like to comment? I'd love to hear it. Or jump in if you do. But hold on to that because you're right around the social support. It's one of the factors. Now the other thing that comes up then with complicated grief, people would say, well I could see that you'd have complicated grief say if your child died because that would be very traumatic like you'd have to have complicated grief then Mm -hmm. but not necessarily Mm -hmm. if you can hold it in your head complicated grief has nothing to do with how much you loved the person I have a woman that that, that does a little bit of teaching for me um, to HR managers Um, her only child developed cancer at two and died (coughs) Uh, and she comes in and talks to them about her work experience because their concern is people that are bereaved coming back to work and what she says every year and every year I'm gobsmacked she says I took six months off when Ronan died I was on the floor I thought I would never recover but you would be surprised she said there's something within you that there's a day you just get up 
and you go out and you start again. And she says, when I went back to work, I never took another day off. Now that still floors me. And it's back to the sort of, a lot you haven't had, but you're afraid you might have. In my case, you're thinking, I just don't think I'll go to work again if something happens to my child. Well, we need to hear from people who have had the experience and can say that. She'd say, I was very well supported. My family were great. Work was great. I knew in work I could leave any time I needed to. And I'd say to myself, I'll just finish this sentence, and if I need to leave, then I'll leave. She'd say, I made a few adjustments. One of her jobs was buying corporate presents. And she said, anything that had to do with buying baby presents, she said she wasn't doing anymore. And she said, about once a year, I allow myself, if somebody's moaning about being up with a baby that's teething, I allow myself a comment around, I'd love to be up with a teething baby. But she'd say, oh, no, see, I find it very challenging. She'd say, I miss him terribly, I loved him dearly. But I also do my job, and my husband does his job, and, and we are finding a new normal. No, it's challenging. So we need to, to let go of that connection of thinking, well, some circumstances will, will, will definitely cause you to have a complicated bereavement, and some won't. So if we're saying every death is difficult in its own way, and every death brings, brings its own complication, but not every death will result in a complicated bereavement. Now, I'm using the term complicated bereavement tonight. Uh, you'll hear prolonged as well, and that's one of the tussles at the moment as to what this is going to be called. Um, I asked Ken Doka, was one of the people involved in some conference or other, I said to him, where did they come up with prolonged? Because I find that deeply unsatisfactory. It's kind of one dimension, prolonged, about length. And he said, well, that was just the compromise. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Seems to be a bit of a rollback now, but at the moment we're calling it complicated bereavement. What are we talking about? Now, some underlying beliefs. Okay? We've talked about the hard wiring. Helen talked about we mourn what we are attached to. As social animals, we're driven to attach ourselves. We can't manage without attachment. Uh, and then we mourn um, when we lose something we're attached to. Does the idea of that internal working model, do people know what that means? That how, you, how you locate yourself in the world, how you, how you see yourself in the world, what you hold. You, you could see where it goes wrong with, say, sometimes, um, say, somebody who's been very obese and loses weight, but they say they still experience themselves as a very fat person. Uh, or somebody who had a problem with alcoholism and has stopped drinking but they're still, you know, that term, a dry drunk. So they haven't, we'd say, they've stopped the alcohol, but they haven't done anything about the ism. You know, so the working model. The working model that needs to change as circumstances change. So you take it in and rework it. But, it's quite, but it happens on a neurobiological level, and that's interesting. So there's something actually kind of inside in us that's tracking all of this and making the difference. So the loss of an attachment relationship is, is painful, and we fight against it. And in, uh, on bad TV, when they always say, I'm so sorry, John died, right? The other person always goes, oh no, there must be some mistake, right? What can we do? It doesn't fit with our model. So the easiest thing to do is, well, we'll just reject that. I know what, I can keep my model as is, and we'll just pretend that's not true. Yeah? And one of the interesting pieces, I think, with complicated bereavement, um, and it's a piece of Kathy Shear's work that I'll reference several times tonight, She'd say, if you're working with someone that's presenting with a complicated bereavement, there's a good chance that they have never taken on board that moment when they heard about the death. And when we look at her protocols a little bit later, and, and I, I found it hugely useful in my own work, and I've done it many times with clients, come back to the moment that you heard, we'll say, that John died. And Kathy Shear's work, what Kathy does is she tapes the conversation and has people listen to it both in the office and as homework and measures the suds, you know, the subjective units of distress, teaches people how to self-soothe and bring down their level, but to actually go back to that piece. And a client said it to me one time in this way, which I found use useful. She was saying, I remember the doctor saying, I'm sorry, it's not good news. 
And she said, then a year happened. And Susan, she said, if that was a year in school, I'd have to repeat the year because I didn't take in anything else after that. The threat to the working model was so great, the rest was blocked out. So it's an interesting piece, I think, clinically, to hold it in your head as a hypothesis. Has this person actually taken on board the death and can they talk about it? <coughs> Maybe you've had, I've certainly had clients that don't even like to use the word death. Passed on and passed away and whatever you're having. I always use the word death because I think it's part of talking about what happened. Um, and I've certainly had at least one client that has taken me to task for that saying, I'd really prefer if you didn't use that word. And I, I empathise and understand that they prefer I didn't use that word. Uh, but I'm going to be using it. Because, you know, the worst has already happened. This person is dead. I would say, you've survived that. Now we just need to, to get the working model to catch up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So a little bit just about the underlying beliefs. Because I think it's quite new. We didn't always have that piece, that attachment tied in so tightly to loss. In doing your history, make sure you have the attachment piece. What did this person mean to this life, to that person? Families are very complicated these days. We don't know what role has granny, mother's boyfriend, my stepbrother. We don't know from the titles. We have to ask, what did that person mean in your life? What kind of attachment was that? So bereavement sets in motion a healing process. What has to happen? How, what has to get incorporated into the working model? And there's an optimal context for healing. And this is our job. Uh, and this is the bit I'm going to suggest to you that sitting and listening therapeutically is not enough with this population. You have these on your, I'm not going to read it out, obviously you have it on your PowerPoints. But, but just to think, I mean, there may be pieces you don't agree with that and I'd love to hear it. Um, but just be aware of what is it that I believe to be true about attachment and loss. Okay. So if you're not going to talk to me, I'll just, I'll just keep talking to you. I'm from Cork, I could talk for Ireland. So we'll just talk, I'll just talk till seven if no one's going to talk back to me. Current thinking, uncomplicated grief. Um, my experience has been that there is a very small percentage of people that present just with a qualitative difference to their bereavement um, I think it's a very small percentage research would suggest the kind of 10, 10 to 15 percent um, so all I can ever say to people is, is look at your own clinical experience your practice wisdom and your own personal experience and, and common sense or as people say well just sense because it's not very common maybe anymore um, what happens if things get a little bit off kilter we'll have a look at there's a couple of inventories at the moment notably Holly Priggerson's work that seems to be able to pick up on it and I would be suggesting to you as psychologists we need to be taking a lead in this if we're able to measure things, if we're able to pick up on something and prescribe a particular treatment for it, then I think ethically we have that obligation. And it does respond to specific intervention, not supportive listening, I put just that reminder, because it's challenging. I've certainly done my, my fair share of Rogerian training and practice, and I find it challenging. I suppose there is a piece of me that still hopes, you know, maybe if I listened even more empathetically that it will happen. Um, but if you've had the experience of being very stuck with a bereaved client, I would suggest to you, consider, if you haven't done so, uh, assessing them for complicated bereavement because it becomes terribly frustrating. If they're not changing, you're getting frustrated and you're stuck in something. Susan? Yeah. Do you have any uh, assessment measures? I mean, yeah. yeah, I do. I'll show, I'll show you two. Uh, Holly Priggerson's grief inventory is probably the one that's most used. Holly and then Priggerson, you have it on your references, but I'll put it up for you in a minute and it's on your, your PowerPoint. And then there's a very short one that Cathy Shear is using um, that hasn't been fully validated yesterday, or yesterday, yet. Um, but it's kind of a quick and dirty one and I, I like it. So I'll show you that one as well. Um, I'm also of the belief that not everything can be measured. So, you know, you have to hold, kind of hold those, that duality. Yeah. 
Okay. So just as a kind of recap on this, you can tell this is one of Cathy Shearer's PowerPoints, obviously, not mine. You have your acute grief reaction, which if we were going visually, would be something like this. Yeah? And everything that goes along with that. The complications which you might be seeing with clients that unable to, to, to think beyond that, unable to experience themselves as anything beyond a bereaved person. The complicating process. The finality not acknowledged, and that's what I was saying to you about people not having taken on board that that person has actually died. And that may be anything from having difficulty recounting when they were told of the death to other things like nobody's allowed to touch the room, you have to go to the grave every day. Ask about that. Be curious about that. Because underlying this sometimes in complicated grief is some of that irrationality around because he'd go mad if he comes back and someone has touched his things. And people know it's mad, but it's still there. He hated anyone to touch his things, so don't touch his things. I have to go up to the grave because I have to make sure it's, it's okay. Why? Because my baby's there on his own. You know, you wouldn't leave him alone in his cot for a day. I wouldn't leave him alone at his grave. Yeah. Now again, as in life, not clear cut. And I'm not saying you're allowed to go to the grave once and any more than that's too much. We need to know what the meaning of that is. Um, the, uh, the person I was saying to you recently when they were saying she goes three times a day. Would you have a problem with that? Her mother died and she went to the grave three times every day. Is that a problem? For how long? <laughs> Could you hear the man in the bus though with that? Wouldn't it be a, I wouldn't like the sound of that now. That's too much. Isn't that that part in all of us? You know, the past remarkable part. Do you think, like, leave your psychology hat off for a minute. Do you think it's a bit much? Yeah. 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 Then you put your psychology hat on and you think, what information am I missing? What is the meaning of her going? Yeah. Where is the grave? Does she live in Dublin and the grave's in Bantry? Then that's the problem. Yeah. What is the meaning of it? And what she would explain, and she's fine with you knowing this, she said, because I used to go and see ma'am three times a day. I dropped the kids to school, go and see ma'am, pick the kids up, call into ma'am, call down to her to say goodnight. So now I, I continue to see her three times a day. But back, and when you sift through the attachment, there, there was very strong evidence, I think, of... Um, difficulty in their relationship. This was a woman and she knows I'm telling you this, she doesn't mind. So you can laugh, but laugh gently. Her mother went on honeymoon with her. And I used to say to her, you know, that's nuts. And she'd say, well, I know, but we were going to such a place and ma'am really wanted to go and Johnny said it was okay. So, but you think, yeah, but it kind of sums it up, you know. Um, just never separated. But it was in death then she was being asked to do what most of us start doing when we're two. Yeah? When you start moving away. That hadn't happened. So the complicated grief in that situation developed that there was no emancipation had occurred, no separation. This, this, this very um, symbiotic attachment and it was too much for her. Um, now you've heard it said of psychologists they're asked in to fix the tap and they want to renovate the house. You know? We do that. We can see all kinds of things that we'd like to be fixing and we could do. But with that person, the question was, what was the problem? Um, the grave was nearby and she was managing to do everything else as well. But her problem with it was she said she couldn't be away from the grave and she felt very badly that her, her small boys hadn't been on a holiday for a couple of years because she could not miss a day. And that was her piece and she did it very beautifully. Of coming up with a kind of, I don't know what you call it, kind of a mobile stuff in a suitcase that she could take places and set up and have her time with her mother. But that was her problem. It wasn't about, let's have a look at why you never emancipated uh, from your mother. She wanted to find a way to be able to go on holidays with her small boys. Job done. We don't need to do any more than that. That's fine. But you start seeing it in terms of what was the attachment between these people. I could only speak um, anecdotally and I don't know, I haven't seen anything in the research around it 
uh, in terms of gender and you were mentioning that um, obviously I see mostly women because hey mostly women come for help uh, mostly women come to anything to do um, with mental health um, mostly women provide the service apologies to men here it's lovely to see you I'm only talking demographically so you get a kind of over feminization um, of, of, of the services um, so it's easy for me to say it's mostly women and um, that present with complicated grief I can't stand over that but what I do see a lot is mothers and daughters uh, and sisters where there was this very very intense relationship um, colloquially what we would say kind of living in each other's ear um, that doesn't sustain then afterwards things come out afterwards that don't add up um, I'm thinking of uh, two people at the moment a sister uh, and the sister died in hospice of like we were each other's best friend we told each other everything I knew everything about her she knew everything about me you won't be surprised to hear in fact that wasn't true the sister that died there was a whole piece of her life that she had not shared but that was very very devastating for my client because that working model then if we go back to that didn't fit anymore we're like this we, I know everything about her you didn't know this what else might you not have known and that whole renegotiation that has to happen then posthumously you're also dealing with the bereavement at the same time but what happens is you don't get that integrated grief where people come to further along with the balls and the jars of saying you know no I still miss them I have good days I have bad di days but you're not getting on with it what else can you do that's someone that's doing their grief work that's very different from, from a complicated grief presentation Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What about visual person this is my idea of grief working if you think of it as grief as a journey and the train and this is what I'll say to people we shouldn't be messing with this if we're psychologists it's very tempting because just as we have our death terror we're kind of interested as well yeah? do you know that? Do you recognise that in yourself? it's really interesting Yeah, for all kinds of reasons this is not our business if someone's presenting on the train on their journey off you go. This is our this is our concern when the train has been derailed. This is complicated grief. Right? You can chat all you want, but until that train gets back on the rails, the person 
can't do their grief work. So we're not talking about doing it for them. We're talking about coming in and doing some intervention so that somebody is back on track, if we can use that phrase, and, and can begin to rework their own working model vis-a-vis -vis what's happened in their life. But I think sometimes, rather than the old talk, that helps of saying, look, is the train on the track? And they're just very upset. And I get those all the time. You know, could you see Johnny? His, he's been married for 85 years and his wife has died and he's very upset. I say, well, I could, but I don't know what I'd be doing for him. Might be worried if he wasn't upset. It's just grief. But there's that in us, isn't it, as carers of us. What, what, what could we do for him? Could, 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 would, would we give him some antidepressants, maybe? You know? It's just sadness, isn't it? There's nothing to do. But this population, we need to be seeing. And I think psychologists are very well placed to be working with this population. Can you help people get back on track so that they can continue their grief journey? Uh, here's a little bit of the differences. I said to you 10. Someone see 20%. I think that's a, that's a little bit high. Just that you have a kind of a, an idea of the differences. And maybe even imagine someone in your head, maybe someone in your own life or someone you have worked with and, know, and can, you, can you notice somebody that you know? Again, the man on the bus, we have some kind of sense. We know that grief doesn't happen in any linear way. But is it fair to say we kind of think that over some length of time, people are sort of somehow doing better? We kind of think that, don't we? No. If you can't mention Johnny's name and it's two years on and someone's in floods of tears, don't you get a little? I mean, don't ever lose that common sense bit when you're working of thinking, oh, this is different. Let's have a look at this. Where might we be stuck? The pangs of grief. So when people say, look, I can't think of anything else. I'm up to here with grief. I feel like there's someone sitting on my chest. That's the psychoeducation piece. We can say, that's grief. It's physical. People are always surprised at how physical grief is. That's physical grief. That's the acute grief. Will it go? Most people find that the way we're hardwired over time, that will ease. Will you ever get over it? That's not even the goal. But will it ease to where you can remember Johnny with love and not always with pain? I think that's a reasonable expectation. <coughs> yeah. that's, the, that's the hardwiring. That's human beings moving towards health. The complicated grief, the difficulty accepting the finality of the death, with persistent, intense yearning and longing. And what I suggested to you earlier is that comes from a kind of a denial of the finality. There's that constant fight with it. So very common in, in any bereavement, people would say, God, I was walking down the street and for a minute I thought I saw Dad. God, I must be losing my marbles. Yeah? Or there's that moment you think, oh, I must tell Mary that. Oh, God. Yeah? That's normal grief. That's those moments. That's very different from that preoccupation or the yearning. Life is not doable without this person. Yeah. Can you see that difference? Yeah. The preoccupation all of my time. Okay, if we consider it this way. This is still here. The preoccupation, the social withdrawal, right? No point talking to anybody. And and, and I just want to tell you maybe one clinical example that, that I learned a lot from and just for what it's worth wanted to share with you um, I was a man I saw many years ago his, they had no children and his wife had died um, and she was the most amazing woman ever and the best wife ever um, and when, when I saw him he presented and he said I couldn't even describe to you she was just fantastic and we were the kind of couple we spent all our time together. We did everything together. We delighted in each other's company. Um, and I can't function without her. We did some work and did some work. And he came back to me one day and he said, you know, when someone says, you've been very helpful, but, you know, you know there's a big but coming. He said, I get it. The ball's in the jars, the shoulder getting stronger. He said, I've learned from you. I, I could live without Mary. I used to think I couldn't. Now I know I could, but he said, hand on my heart, Susan, I don't want to. And he said, that's it. And I'm just out of courtesy. He said, out of courtesy, I'm telling you that. 
I'm not interested. I don't want I don't want to live without her. I'm older, we've no kids, life has no interest for me, there's no pleasure without her. And even though I did all my um my psychology bits, I think it caught me in another way, um thinking, is that is that reasonable? Is that rational? I don't know how it strikes you, I'm giving you a potted version, but it certainly caught me in a way of thinking you just say he said look I'm not depressed I'm saying I know we've done jars balls and shoulders yeah, but I don't want to I don't want to live without her that's my choice and I, I really got caught and I thought and you always know you're in trouble with something you know if you're thinking about it a lot or you're at home in bed thinking about it not good um, and we were talking about he was quite suicidal at that point what he would do mm-hmm. and he was saying he would he stockpiled you know as I hope you know that bereaved people stockpile pills because Suicide is often an option of thinking, I don't know if I'm going to continue living. Um, he said, well, I have, I have the pills, you know, and that's the plan. And then he said something that taught me so much. And he said, and I'll take plenty because the last time I tried, I didn't take enough. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Rewind it. I'm sorry. What did you say? The last time you tried? And when was this? number one bad assessment on my part this was news this should not be news uh, and he said oh sorry sorry did I not tell you that no you didn't uh, about ten years ago I was going through a very bad time I tried to kill myself mm-hmm. well this is totally different now you're telling me this is a pattern you're, now you're telling me you have a default position when things get tough you consider suicide you're telling me when you when you're most amazing wonderful wife was alive and you had every day together you still reached a place that you thought you might kill yourself I said no this is no I said no no totally different no there's a totally different field but I'd missed that piece and and what I'm saying to you and I hope it's useful is he nearly got me with it I was nearly seduced into thinking not sure maybe like maybe it was that sort of idyllic relationship I could only imagine that you know he just didn't want to live without her and I was totally missing the peace Thank you. he had a default of when life gets tough maybe suicide is the answer yeah. and it was a mistake on my part but I think it's a little bit about how we get caught because of the nature of the work um, it's not an option and you know he's still alive I don't know but I, I, I thought it was a, a, big, a big mistake on my part Graciously, he gave me the information and we continued on. But it was something about the seduction or the thinking, boy, what if? Is there someone in my life? And it catches you one way or the other. Is there someone in my life that I'd feel I couldn't live without them? That catches you. If you're thinking, God, I've never had that in my life. It gets you that way. It gets you one way or the other, doesn't it? Yeah. Very different. Not linear. We're not saying flu model they're very upset and then they're a little bit upset and then they're grand we know the strobe model with the dual process we know people have good days and bad days and that's how it goes um, but there's a qualitative difference in this ok a little bit on risk assessment this is such a hot potato the answer to all this is everyone says yes we better do a risk assessment who should do it? the nurses kind of decided on nurses with this um, it's a very very difficult area how do we assess who is at risk of developing a complicated bereavement all I'm saying to you tonight is be aware it's not easy and if someone asks you to do it have a good hard think um, if someone has a life limiting illness and there's a concern uh, about a family member you can't ethically be doing an assessment on someone that's not a client stroke patient there is no file on them you don't have their permission they don't know that you're assessing them Um, so there's loads of risk assessment checklists but at your peril agree to be part of it we need to be very cautious it's very important and and the nurses I work with are tremendous and they know it when they say have a niggle about so and so they're nearly always right you know but what are we, how are we going to put that down and who's going to put their hand up to say, yeah, this person is at risk. It's, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, how are we going to assess it? Uh, yeah. 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 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you don't have a mandate with uh, a family yeah. member. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know that sometimes our hands are tied. They are, aren't they? And I think even if it's even if we get to that of recognising it. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Hospice gets caught into things. People in special needs get caught into it. Well, we went out and we had to look at at the house and you know to see would it be suitable and all this. You think really? And did the family know you were doing that assessment? Are there days you'd prefer people weren't assessing your family for things? Yes. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Yeah. What do you do with that? Uh, yeah. Yes. We do a risk assessment. Really. Be sure you the person knows that that's what you're doing. And plenty to suggest. And Denai Papadatu was in town. Uh, um, if I go on now, will I be able to find it? Why didn't I put it there? Um, ah, that's the one I want. This is Denai Papadatu, the Greek psychologist, was here recently. Um, and this was some of her workers suggesting, look, I, I, I'll put up some of the factors, but anything can be a factor. All right? When people say, is it worse if, if someone dies suddenly or if they die after a long illness, which would put you at risk? Well, both for the wrong reason. At the very least, be aware of there's the bereavement, there's how somebody appraises the situation, there's the interpersonal risk factors and the intrapersonal risk factors, and they all come into play. So there isn't anything simple. We can't just say, well, if your partner dies suddenly, yep, you're likely to have a risk, you're likely to have a complicated grief. If your child dies, you're likely, etc., etc. There is nothing. And it's very dangerous territory to suggest in any way that the complication suggests. Um, or, or is some measure of how much you loved the person. It's not. Now, can I go backwards? Would be the question. No, that's forwards. Oh, no. I'll go back. Sorry. No. Bottom left corner. Bottom left? I'll have to go forward. Sorry, just talk. Should I? Just talk amongst yourselves there now for a moment. Uh, I'm just going to show them to you and I'm not going to go on about them um, but, but to have kind of some kind of a scaffold in your head to think about the nature of the death can certainly put you at risk for a complicated grief factors relating to the griever the relationship and the resources and I'd include in that social support available yeah? we all know as psychologists the best predictor of future behaviour is past behaviour that's always a good piece of information to have how did this person manage other change or loss in their life that's going to give you a lot of information um, the nature of the death is difficult because it, it, it pretty much covers everything um, they're just different losses a sudden loss very difficult you know there's, there's been no warning signal you didn't expect it um, it's like a body blow you didn't get to say what you wanted to say but certainly and the deaths I'd be more familiar with are, are following a life limiting illness where people have got terribly involved in the care of their loved one um, <coughs> or they get used to these calls come to the hospital he's not doing well and they go and things improve and they go and things improve and you think it's always going to be like that um, a violent death a random death you know anything that that challenges the working model one that's not on there and, and we could include it when there's no body for example think how difficult that is you know how do you negotiate reworking a, a model that says well you never know maybe you know such and such um, so you have sudden loss and death following a long illness so that kind of covers most of the deaths so it's not a very helpful predictor but it's maybe just useful to have it in your head as as a thought and I'll not go through them them all you have them on the powerpoint um, but if you think about the person and what they're bringing the percentage of themselves that they bring the insecure attachment you know the history of how they dealt with other changes what else is going on for them particularly these days things like people also have been made redundant for example which they mightn't think to to mention is a concurrent stress the financial difficulties that's caused by perhaps this person that's, that's now died or a personal encounter with death you know that how much that, that idea that your own life was at risk certainly 
uh, makes it more likely that you'll develop a complicated bereavement, but not necessarily. Yeah? What about the number of losses? Yeah, yeah. The kind of concurrent stresses are multiple losses. Yes. Exactly. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the interpersonal risks, I think, are interesting. And again, you're looking at the attachment. Um, one of the ones where people are surprised sometimes when it's a parent of saying, God, I really, my dad and I were like this. I can't, I can't believe I miss him so much. And Cruz will say, Cruz Northern Ireland will say, the, uh, the most calls they get to their, their telephone line are um, adult children around an adult, the, the death of a parent. And one of the suggestions around that is because it's not one of the ones that we hold. You know, if your child dies or your partner dies, there, there are systems that support you and there are support groups. But there's kind of an expectation when you get to be 40, 50, 60 that your parent will die and you've known other people and their parents will die. But it can hit you like a ton of bricks then. And you have one parent die and then maybe if a second parent dies, there's the day you wake up and think, I'm an orphan now. I'm an orphan now. And think, oh. Yeah? and the tailspin that can come from that but it's interesting, it's a kind of a cohort that I don't think we've paid enough attention to poor social support I mentioned to you um, personal religious beliefs religious beliefs are a bit contentious you heard John McAvoy and was it Helen one night there they had different views on it depends what paper you're reading um, does it support people, does it not obviously it can be a tremendous support sometimes um, if people have a belief that there's, there's a bigger plan um, but also a time of, of tremendous religious crisis for people when something that they would have turned to for support suddenly becomes I, I no longer believe in a God that would do this now where's my support or, or you, know, the, you know I played by the rules I expected things would be fair so it, it can kind of go either way yeah. so again an ambivalent relationship always or that very dependent and I suppose I do see that um, with a lot of my clients you know the the antenna goes up when you hear the per how perfect this person was we went everywhere together Susan we never spent a night apart I hope those send shivers up your spine yeah oh, we never had a row never <laughs> we nev and I'll say to them I don't think I've gone a day without having a row with my fella yeah? and they're shocked but what can you do yeah yeah but you know what, what is the story that you tell yourself around that and sometimes then I think what they're giving you is that's your work can you mourn all of the person not this idealised version of them but it does sometimes suggest that there's never been any preparation um, we had a very traditional marriage Susan you know, he, he looked after all the money I never did that don't know how to write a cheque don't know how to take money out of the holding ball mind you he couldn't put on the washing machine never any idea that you know, how is one of us going to manage if someone else couldn't uh, I had another client recently and I thought it was just so lovely he said his, his wife that had died he said I'm still finding stickies around the place where she'd leave me you know I know you're not very good on the the dryer so remember to blah 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 you know but it was lovely it was like how do you set each other up but does the death denial get into where we've never contemplated life without this person we've just never gone there and you see then how that gets echoed around not hearing that person has died We've never even tiptoed in. I hope in your own work and with your own losses that you've allowed yourself to go there just to the edge, just to tiptoe, to think, but what if, what if that person died? What would I do? How would I manage? And what are the, are the basic living skills that you need to manage? Um, I saw a man one day, and he knows I'm telling you this too, I said, what did you do? He was all banged up. He said, I had a desperate car crash. What happened? No, this tells you a lot about men and women. Take from it what you will. He said, well, I'd always have been driving and the wife would be sitting in the front and we'd come up to the main street and she'd say, you're all right on the left, John. And I'd head off into the traffic. And she watched it. He'd come up and he turned and plowed. Now, why he didn't kill somebody was the only good thing. But don't you get that idea of the relationship? I can't imagine sorry, a man that would take a woman's you're alright on the left, come on if you're the driver, you're the driver but their relationship, if she said he was alright on the left, he took her word for it and then the loss of that, you know it's lovely I think there's kind of layers to it and I'm not telling it against him, I said that to him that's just so lovely, that's what we do in a good relationship we play to our strengths but we become so dependent on them 
we don't even notice the absence. He said, Susan, I didn't stop for a minute. I don't know how I didn't kill a child. You know, the scare that he got. The working model hadn't been adapted to say, you now must look to the left to see if there's a car. I forgot she wasn't there. She's always there. We're asking people to run a marathon when, when their leg's been amputated. Yeah? Were in a very intense relationship like that. Yeah. Or a parent. Yes. Or, um, or in a couple. Where one of them had mental health problems. Yes. Long standing. Yes. And uh, incredibly, she did very, very well. Great. Well, what would you put that down to? Uh, so we don't, in some way, to explore or experiment uh, yeah. the possibility of being able to live. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yes. Permission to do that. Yeah. Yeah. With good support well, to do that. With, with, with less because there been a complete oh, I see. Yeah. Within, but I mean support from other people that that was an okay thing to do. Yes. Yes. So sometimes the dependency is somewhat enforced on people. It's not what they signed up for. Sometimes we find each other and we fit together so well we think it's true love yeah but sometimes dependency comes through maybe a chronic illness or something yeah 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 the ability to think bigger than the ball in the jar I am more than just the care of somebody uh, and someone who will listen to you and not judge you when you talk about the relief that comes yeah yeah and the more we stop people by saying God weren't you just marvellous and the way you took care of Mary, you can be sure you've closed on any conversation around saying, you know, I actually cried with relief when it was finally over to think I could go to bed at night and not be awoken every hour on the hour to change bed sheets and to, you know, yeah. Don't we have to sometimes hold that space for people where they can say the unsayable? Yeah, yeah. Good. Thanks. Okay. And the protective factors then just some of the others. Only You have them on the PowerPoint, so the only things to think about uh, in terms of if there's someone you're wondering, they're the kind of things to, to run through your head and thinking, really, what kind of boxes would they, would they tick? Um, this is Prigerson's. Is that in your way? Put that. Is it in people's way over there? No. Um, it's an, a 19-point scale. Um, at the moment, that's what we're using. Prigerson is, is primarily a researcher she writes particularly in the area of complicated grief and has really been the, the primary driver to getting it into the new DSM. She's not, uh, she's not a practitioner, but the research she does is, is very, very robust. Um, so you have, to, you have to appreciate that. This does seem to be able to pick up complicated grief. Now, you know, there's plenty you can say about what does that word mean or what does that word mean. There's a cut-off for it, etc. That's all, you know. You don't need to know that, but at least to know this is the measure that people are typically using if, if they're doing um, a pre and post for something they're hoping they're hoping to publish. And is it the practitioner fills that out? The person, no, the person, yeah, and good question. So the person themselves. Is that the yeah. Person who's yeah. Yeah. And is it a Likert scale or? Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. And there's a cut off. Wait, no, I can tell you. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, score higher than 25, um, and it goes, it, and it's on, it's on a um, four point. Yeah, no, that's one, and that's probably the one that I said used mostly in research. When um, Kathy Shear was here last year, uh, training in complicated grief, this is her quick and dirty one, um, that I must say I've been using. This is on a not at all, somewhat, or a lot, so a three point scale. Yeah. And she's calling it, she uses it as a screening uh, with a score greater than four as being positive. Um, and I've kind of taken to asking people this. Now, she hasn't, and she will, because she is she's both practitioner and researcher, and she publishes prolifically in the area. I'm sure she will um, get that out there. But it, it has that kind of face validity about it. 
without the kind of nine, and 19 questions, I think. Holly, I could have thrown in one more and gone for the 20. Mm-hmm. I don't. But that's because it's very clearly done from, you know, the, the crunching the numbers. Um, you know the dilemma always when you, 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 you meet somebody, how much time do you spend on assessment versus uh, starting to build a relationship? It can be difficult. I suppose I'm just offering it to you and saying, you know, if nothing else, maybe run through these questions. Um, and I think always privileging what the bereaved person themselves has to say. Do they think it's a problem? Do they think there's something about their bereavement that's not going in the right direction? Are there things you used to do when John was alive that you're not anymore? Are you feeling cut off? Are you having preoccupying images? How much does grief interfere with your life? How much trouble are you having accepting the death? My experience has been that people have that sort of a sense of is this as it was? They'll say, this is nothing like when my dad died. That's different. You know, I was very upset. I'm not saying I wasn't upset, but this is different. And I think we need to hear that. You know? It's um, about the number of, of losses. Yeah. Cumulative effects of different yeah. kinds of losses yeah. at the same time. Yeah. 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 Yes. Two siblings in terms of child. Yeah. Still born a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Got very ill. Yeah. And you could and you could do you could do each one. But might not be the work of saying, let's just even name mm. the losses you've had. Which ones haven't been grieved? We know that any new loss activates old losses. But any healing also, any healing you do with, it, with a new loss, you know, has beneficial impact on old losses. So it's never too late to heal. And you're right. And I, and I, I would frequently see women in their 60s, 70s, we might be talking about a spousal bereavement, and then they'll, they'll bring up something about a miscarriage from 50 years ago, you know. And you think, well, of course, your body experiences that as loss and says, ah, this is familiar, and what about how do you even know what loss you're crying about or feeling? Yeah. Wouldn't it be interesting to do it on each one of saying, what's the most but difficult? Really wants to do with the yeah. Yeah. Whereas obviously it's always yeah. 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 Deal with the current yeah. It's all shadows and shades of past. Yeah. Yeah. So your, your question then to yourself is, can you meet her where she is? Mm-hmm. Can that be a contract? Or, you know, or, or, or is that not possible? Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know the answer, but I think that of even the naming of thinking, you certainly have experienced a lot of loss. Why do, why, why do you think that is? Why, why do you think that is? Yeah. What's her? What's the story she tells herself around that? Yeah. But don't be too quick to jump and say, therefore that's what we would say is, yeah, that puts her at risk of having a complicated bereavement, but not necessarily. That's always the piece, and I know that's very sort of unhelpful sometimes. We think, yeah could be let's have a look yeah what happens when i'm listening is it the same story over and over is the languaging around it i can never live without this person i don't want to go on i can't go on every night i go to bed and i go through the story of uh, you know yeah and are we in some way helping or hindering that yeah and sometimes i say to people look sorry about this but i say if it was like a scab on your hand and if you're just picking at it and picking at it, you're going to infect it, right? The only reason for going there is we need to be doing something with it, right? Are we going to put some salve on it so you can start to see it differently? I promised him I'd be there when he died and I wasn't, yeah? And you know, as a listener, and you think, oh, Jesus, if I have to listen to this again, you know it and you know it and you know it, right? At what point do we need to intercede and say, I'm just going to pause there with you and say, I appreciate that didn't go well. Was there anything that did go well? You know, when is it our job to step sideways? Now, the early training was all around, you know, let people tell their story and let them tell it as many times as they need to or want to. And in telling us the story, they're telling themselves and they're hearing it and shifting it. The piece you'll notice in complicated grief is the story doesn't start changing. People don't spontaneously say, but on the other hand, such and such, you know, you don't get that piece and that's where I'm saying it's almost like and it's, it can be a dirty word in, in therapy when we talk about where's our place to confront it 
to say, I'm just going to stop you there. Yes, I know that was hard for you. You've told me that many times. I wonder, could we look at blah, blah, blah. That's the salve, and that's what's different. On, in a natural grief, people come to that themselves. Yeah? I'm so sad that John died. But, you know, I was thinking to myself, sure, at least he didn't suffer, or it would have been worse if... And yet here, the natural resilience is kicking in. Our job in, in a complicated bereavement is to step in and, and help people come, come to that. So that's, that's Kathy Shear's piece. Yes. I've had two situations. One, one was with a friend, but one was with a child. Yeah. Um, and being a friend, having lost a son very, very suddenly um, at 21 years of age. And she got very caught up in the idea she was being punished. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. she said, I was pregnant with him when we got married. Yeah. This is my punishment. Yeah. Yeah. It really kept her back for a long time. Yeah. yeah. She's only now really yeah. able to <coughs> smile and laugh yeah. and, and have be back to normal friendships and everything. Yeah. Like seven years, like eight years. Yeah. Yeah, and the piece Ursula spoke about last week, talking about Bob Niemeyer's work, the meaning making, sometimes can be very helpful. But boy, can't you come up with that with with the meaning making that sets you back? I had an abortion when I was 15. I was pregnant when we got married. I never wanted to be pregnant. You know, I tried to. You know, those are the complications. And our job in sitting with somebody is not closing down any potential doors but asking that what is the story you tell yourself why do you think this happened what's your understanding and she had it yeah, yeah. and the other lady is quite an elderly lady who looked after her brother for a few years after he'd had a bad stroke mm. but after the death discovered with the autopsy report that it was it was malpractice in fact mm. it was what was it can be what what do you decide now you're going to do with it you have a choice yeah sometimes that can happen afterwards also no case there was someone saying this isn't okay the doctor should have picked up on this promise me that when I die you'll fight it all the way to the high court you know the things people get left with yeah but there's a choice and again that's where you say okay that's one option What's the best possible outcome of that for you? Because what? No amount of money is going to be enough. Do you know? But having her, having her walk that piece of thinking, what will be a good outcome? Not to say you don't, and there has to be accountability. Yeah, you know, we're not. But she actually came to me after she had taken it. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. And you think, no, you, you did that bit of business. Now I can do this. What's my piece of work with you? Yeah. Sorry. No, I just I, I, two things yeah. said there. I actually work at St. James's in psychological medicine, so yeah. it's it interesting the whole cultural piece actually about accountability now is huge. Yeah. People will, one of the first, you know, you know, in terms of just maybe people looking for a reason hmm. that somebody died. Hey, it must that's be someone's fault. I, Who I, do I sue? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the one thing that that's that's certainly yeah. something you can notice more. Yeah. The other thing is just around cognitive flexibility. Yes. Do you, would yes. you see that as, an, uh, as a factor in terms yeah. of people who uh, experience complicated grief? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a rigidity in how we are. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm, I'm a big fan of my clients of doing mindfulness and doing yoga. I think any, any flexibility of body is reflected in flexibility in thinking. But the story we tell ourselves, I think, is huge around that. Mm-hmm. And noticing that it's a story, it's one way of looking at it. But it's part of the meaning-making that we're driven to do. Mm-hmm. And I, I sometimes use the example with people who talk about the Kennedy family in America and all the like, tremendous amount of loss that family had. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. and, and people would say, well, it's, yeah. well, of course, that was old man Kennedy. You know, that was bad money. That was, that was gambling money. Yeah? And you say, I'm sorry, so what you're saying is, you know, but we do that. How do I make sense of this? And, and how often it's a harsh judgment on ourselves that we carry and who do you say to and often our job is to create a space where people can say the unsayable yeah. 
don't ever say you could say nothing that won't shock me because <laughs> there's always something else yeah. there's always something else yes yeah, there's loads. You see, it's very interesting when you get into it. I'm not. It's it's late, and I just want you to have these the proposed criteria as we're looking at the new DSM. Consider, does that surprise you? If you're talking about six months, if we're moving it back, think about people you've worked with, and consider: was there a red flag six months that we didn't notice because we're not looking for it at six months? People that get referred to to a bereavement support service, a listening service. Um, what are the indicators? What are we looking for that says, you know, we need to kick this up a level? We call that kind of level two as a listening service, up to level three as a as a more formal counselling, psychotherapy, psychiatry. Yeah. What is it that's going on? So this is what's been fought out at the moment in DSM, um, and and it's about degree. The intense yearning. Yearning is a great word because you know yearning. We've been there ourselves. But when it becomes intense, when it's the ball filling all of the jar, that's a different matter. Preoccupying thoughts. It's like, no, I know I'm talking to you, but there's this whole loop running all the time. Yeah? All the time. That's different from saying, he comes into my head every now and again. Susan, can I ask you? Yeah. What, what do you think about the six months? I think that I have had to reconsider my position. I think in retrospect, when I look back, that's what I see, that there was red flags, but I wasn't looking for them at six months. Mm -hmm. So it's the best we have. Look, things change in everything. We can sit here and we're sort of a little bit sneering about Kubler-Ross, even though she was never talking about bereavement in the first place. People are going to be standing here 50, 100 years from now and thinking, imagine what they believed then you know how is it going to progress I don't know so it's the best we have and, and it's always that tension isn't it the research versus practitioner uh, and I've seen Holly Previson for example present to a very chilly audience of uh, counsellors saying oh, I think we know I think we know better and uh, how many clients have you seen anyway um, practitioners need to listen to researchers and researchers need to listen to practitioners. It goes both ways. But I, I, am, I am willing to concede that I think because in my head I had something that pushed it out, saying I would be very slow to put a diagnostic label on someone, I've, I've had to reconsider that. And the research is very robust. Go look it up for yourself. You know, when people say, well, no, that's, I don't think so. Well, go and look at it. I mean, that's what she does bring to the field is very robust research. And, and I think it's interesting. Because, you know, the, the man on the bus bit, I think, what is that? We give people a couple of days for bereavement, or we have it in our head that it should kind of be a year, you know, based on what? Can we, as psychologists, go back to the evidence? And, and it's, probably, it's the best we have at the moment. Um, I'm trying to give you as, as honest an answer as I can. I think what I've reworked myself is looking earlier. I think there's a number they say is it seven years it takes from the time research comes out to when it actually gets bedded down into practice and I think we're in that sort of space at the moment but I think part of our job is to say are we missing things earlier because as you might have a sense these people going to see a trained listener is not going to move anything uh, and we need to be picking them up earlier and if we could kind of get the people experiencing a normal bereavement getting the support they needed and, and the 10% with a complicated bereavement accessing the psychological services we'd have a much better I think service provision for bereaved people and I think that's part of psychology's job the kind of education around that or presenting that, that information but it's, it's challenging I won't, I won't take that what do, you, what do you think? It just seems very soon but, yeah. but I would think that it depends on the person's behaviour, if you like. Yeah. There could be yeah. red flags yeah. showing yeah. in their behaviour. You know, somebody who's not yeah. going out for six months. Yeah. So that as practitioners, maybe an openness to looking yeah. for the red or flags. Someone who's not sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what Ursula said last week again was saying we send out the invitations 
and about 10% of people come back. And that's, that's quite a figure. Most of the hospices, for example, would say about 10% is the take-up. But isn't that interesting? I think, are people self-diagnosing? And are we listening? Now we get the other side. People will call and say, Johnny died on Tuesday and I'm really upset. Or I'm very worried about ma'am. She's crying all the time. Can you see her? We have a role to say, can you just pause? It's okay. Of course she's upset. That's grief. You know, you can see people too early and they're not psychologically ready. Um, but I suppose as, as practitioners, we must always be saying, and what am I making that determination based on? And I think that's what psychology should bring to this kind of field of saying, is that just because that's what we do in my family or that's what I did when my husband died? Come on, we know better. Can we go to the research? Can we read the research and interpret it and say, let's see. Can I go back and look at people? Was there something at six months that I missed because I wasn't looking? Yeah. Yeah. And as a parent, perhaps has complicated grief, the impact that that would have on the children yeah. in terms of their grief and their mourning, yeah. so the quicker that's picked up yeah. and they're helped to get back on track, the better the family system is. Good point. So, mm-hmm. good point. So, yeah. they, could, they could fall through that gap if you've got an avoidance. They could. Even yeah. They could. And help them yeah. get through that, that, yeah. that trauma. So, you have another piece with parents, though, as well, or we say of a surviving parent that would say and make sense of saying I had to put my grief on hold mm-hmm. because I needed yeah. to take care of my children. But would that make sense? Yeah. Are they able to do that? Okay. So you know that's the normal perhaps if you're trying to grieve mm-hmm. yes. but we're talking about complex. Yeah. And the difference of being able to say, but well, Dad, I think you need something here as well for yeah? Mm-hmm. yeah. I'm concerned about this, this, this. How does that sound to what do you think? You know, can you can you get them on board with that and thinking what can we do that will shift that? Yeah, and mum or dad doing well means kids are doing well. Yeah, but you know, again, don't take my word of them saying this will all change in 50 or 100 years, so it's the best we have, we have for now. If it's okay with you, I'm not going to go through the criteria. You have them. It's um, what they're looking at for DSM. Come on. Okay. Now. Ursula showed you last. At the moment, this is the, the flavour of the month, the dual process model, the loss and restoration, and it really is that of saying, how can we get people on two tracks that they're attending to their loss, but there's some restoration, they also have a future focused, and that also allows for a bit of a break from your grief as well. When people will say, well, I was going to go to Spain, but I know that's only running away from my problems, or I know that's only denial. Denial gets a terrible rap, doesn't it? I'm, I'm actually a big fan. <laughs> Would it be so bad? So what? Go to sp- if you went to Spain for a week and you ran away from it for a week? Hmm. It would be interesting. Yeah. But again, these are the beliefs that are held. We are part of the culture that holds these beliefs. Challenge yourself and the assumptions that you hold around these things. Now, that, that has improved a lot, though, Susan, hasn't it? Yes. I mean, years ago, it, it wasn't okay for people to go out for a month after their spouse died. But it was prescribed. You know, again, we threw the baby out with the bathwater. I remember the, the diamonds and the armbands. There was a visual. People had a year. Black clothes for a year. Now we've nothing. So yeah. we, we gained some, we lost some. Yeah? Now, the, Cathy Shear that I was talking to you about uh, in the school nursing in Columbia. I think has come up with what is I think the best protocol we have around working with complicated grief and I just put up the strobe um, slide before that to show you it's quite similar you have the loss focused um, she calls it I think that's interesting restoration is the word that strobe and should use um, she calls it renewal focused which I think is actually a better word because she's saying well it's not restorative it's not going back to what it was it's new so it's probably actually an improvement I think on it um, so she's working from what's quite an evidence based model and um, considered I suppose one of, one of our best models at the moment she's working from this but what she'll say straight up is do not sit with people with complicated bereavement and talk about grief for all the time you have with them you must straight off begin this as well because this is what's been let go of when the, when the ball is filling all the jar there's none of this and you must start into it straight away we are doing people no favours to just 
activate the grief, have the whole session, which they will gladly fill, telling you memories and stories and how badly they feel, and nothing is attended to here. Take control of the time with them and be sure that you're addressing both sides and that they know that they're on board with that, that they know what you're, what you're doing. So the principles then that she uses is saying, how can we get people on board to provide the optimal healing in this way? And I'll leave you with that one. I want to show you a little bit of the work that she does. Um, and this is it. The grief monitoring to, to get a bit of a baseline and secondly, to help people see it's not all the time, right? When people say to you, I just think of John all the time. It's probably not physically possible, right? So she begins straight away getting people to, to monitor the grief maybe on every hour or every whatever and notice on, you know, for example, on a scale of one to ten, how we are feeling or were you thinking about John or were you not? Just to start being a little bit reflective about their grief, not in that all or nothing way, but to begin to notice, oh, the mornings are much worse or, you know, it's not too bad during the day. Actually, the nights are the worst. So you move it a little bit from having just this blank wall of there is nothing to say, oh, there's those little chinks. Or, and yeah. that using diaries? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So immediately there's this buy-in and they're doing the work. This is your grief, right? This is what's happening. The psychoeducation, the explaining grief. And it's a curious piece that doesn't ha always happen. People say, I had no idea that grief was like that. I thought people were upset and cried. My God, nobody talks about the irritability that goes along with grief and how hard that is to support people. My God, you're wrong if you do it and you're wrong if you don't do it. The crankiness, the poor concentration and attention. People coming and saying, I'm not kidding. I think maybe I have Alzheimer's. And I'm the sole carer now. I'm the only one. And what am I going to do? You know, I, I lost this. And, I, you know, can we explain to people? Can that be part of our job? So people are actually being educated on grief. Immediately setting some personal goals. One of the questions she uses in that is saying, if you weren't so overwhelmed by your grief at the moment, what would you be doing? Hmm? Not asking you to do it, but can you hear it? It's that it's a little bit bigger jar. Yeah, of trying to the the moving in a positive psychology way towards it. Meeting with a significant other, bringing somebody else in to the meeting, and she has a protocol around this. I don't know, is it on week three? She does it or whatever. But interesting to bring someone else in to hear their perspective on it. What do you think is hardest for Mary? Tell me about John and Mary's relationship from your perspective. You're kind of bringing in an ally. Imaginal revisiting. You'd know this is a psychologist wrote it, wouldn't you? We never use like a two-syllable word when a three-syllable word will do. Yeah. Uh, imaginal revisiting. For example, what I was saying to you, going back to the moment you heard about the death and getting people to, to go through that. Using the suds but kind of in, in, if you like, kind of very cognitive therapy way of working, you know, be it flooding, desensitization, getting people to tolerate. No, I can't, I can't. Well, let's try a little bit. And it's very gently done with your permission. Is it okay? You know, you can signal me if you need to stop. I'll ask you the suds. When it gets above five, we'll stop. You know, very, very, very nicely contained. But that willingness just to take the steps into um, haven't gone into the bedroom since he died. Beginning either imaginal or situational revisiting, the breaking it down into steps. Because she'll say, once somebody is hiving off pieces, the working model can't be renegotiated. I haven't looked in his briefcase. Somebody called me and worked the other day to say that, but his, his toolbox is still there from when he came home. I haven't touched it. That's understandable, but it's a little piece that needs to happen. I haven't gone into the study, the bedroom. I haven't looked at a photograph of her. Whatever meaning there is around these pieces being hived off, everything is on the table. But all done in, in, in quite a cognitive way um, and very collegial, all in working with the bereaved person. Um, don't ask me how she gets her, her clients to do all kinds of things. My clients just say they won't do it. But you know when you have the aura of obviously they're going to see Dr. Shear and it's all very different um, 
we've had those conversations and she says, well, this is the research. There are the days it goes wrong. It's good to hear, isn't it? Yeah. I thought it was just me. Um, but that revisiting. So everything is on the table, a very detailed history. You know, where, where is the difficulty? What is it that, that hasn't been integrated into the working model? Bring in memories and pictures. Very common for people to not look at photographs. That has been my experience. It's either that's like the whole house is plastered in photographs to where nobody else gets a look in, like nobody else's communion gets noticed or nobody else can put up a photograph or no looking at photographs. Could you get people to Absolutely, yeah. And that very often being the safest place to start. Yeah. And again, taking it back as far as you need to, what would it be like? Can you just sit for a moment, feet on the floor? Can you imagine which photograph might you choose to bring in if you were going to? How would you know you might be ready to bring it in? And can you imagine if you brought it in? You know, so you can go as far back as you need, right up to, can we have a look at it together? Yeah, with the suds, with the managing. Yeah, uh, everything taped, and she asked people to listen to the tapes at home. So, for example, the the moment you heard about the death, the homework would be listen to it at home. So you get that desensitisation to it, and she'll say to people, the worst has already happened. He has died and you have survived that. You can do this. This is just to allow your body to catch up. Yeah? Who's asking me? Yeah. What about people who look at pictures now that yeah. almost like they're constantly re traumatizing themselves? Yeah, yeah. And that's this. Yeah. Yeah. What's the story you're telling yourself about it? And sometimes my, my experience has been that it, it comes from places of saying, I'm terrified I'm going to forget them. I have to keep looking. I have to keep looking. Can we trust that you you you, you will remember them? But I th I think that's where I go with that of thinking what's what what need is that serving? What's not happening without it? So with that person, you don't need to do this piece. They're on it. But but what is not being attended to? I look in at the photographs all the time. But no, I haven't touched his wardrobe. Everything is exactly as he left it, and that's the way it's staying. No, the six children are sleeping in the one box room because no one's allowed to touch the other room because that's his room. And what's the thing? And a curiosity. We don't know what meaning that has, but we can ask and be curious about it. Yeah? Curious is another word that gets a bad rap. It's a good thing to be when you sit with people. Does somebody else want to ask? No, I thought I caught a hand. Okay. I, I've referenced her in... in, in um, at the end of the PowerPoint. Um, she's certainly not the only person writing or developing protocols. Terry Rando, you might do, has done quite a lot around traumatic grief uh, and has a new book coming out on EMDR and complicated grief, which if people are interested in that, I find that kind of interesting because I do think trauma is held in the body. That has some potential. I'm not trying to sell you on this is the one and only. I think this has a lot of components that intuitively make sense to me and I think it fits very well with skills that psychologists bring to their work. Um, so I suppose what I'm saying is it's one I'm keen on and I just would only recommend it for, for what it's worth. Uh, if you're struggling with trying to find a kind of a scaffold for how, how will I work with this person. It does involve a lot of buy-in and a willingness to, to go to those difficult places. But trust me, nobody wants to feel the way you feel in a complicated grief. It's an appalling place to be. And boy, do you burn out your peers, your colleagues, your neighbours, you know, mm -hmm. absolutely people draw back. Um, and I think it just, it just provides uh, a little bit of a blueprint that you can share with somebody. I'm saying, well, well, what? You know, are you on board? Will we give it a go? How will we know if we're getting there? And how does that answer change to ask somebody, so if we were meeting for the last time, what would be different? If you weren't so overwhelmed by, by your grief, <coughs> where would you be? The imaginal conversation is that with the person. Yeah, with yeah. the person. The link do you back. Do that in the the link back. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I mean, this is the protocol. Yeah. She's doing the papers on it, so it's yeah. a very tight protocol. Yeah. <coughs> you know, between yeah. ourselves we can yeah. you know um, very uh, blended way. Yeah, it may or may not be appropriate. Because it's that piece of saying, Oh, John wouldn't want you feeling like that, you know, just so unhelpful. But what would that conversation be like if he was here? What do you think he might say to you to help you right now? <coughs> what would he say? The psychoeducation piece, I mean, I presume you talk a little bit about somatic symptoms and symptoms. Yeah. 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 
Because again, yeah. one, of the, one of the groups yeah. that we would see in, in James that would refer to yeah. us would be medically unexplained symptoms. Yeah. The amount of time that there is uh, a significant bereavement within probably five years of person's Fantastic. Quite extraordinary. Yeah. And it's we don't really we don't make the link. We don't make the link. No. Women no. attend GP saying, I my arm I have such pains in my arms. Yeah. And you trace it back. Yeah. You know, miscarriage is still birth. And we know that. Women get pains in their arms. But uh, you know, as as a culture we don't we, we forget <coughs> to connect the dots. Yeah. 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 And I do think it's important and I think when we get very psychological or into our doing our psychotherapy, I think we, we sometimes lose that piece of thing. Do people understand what grief is? Well, I, well and, and you know, my experience again has been that people are kind of aware of Kubler Ross's work and they're sort of saying, well, well I haven't really done anger <coughs> yet, we need to be doing that, or you know, this, or you know, do we, can we check with people what their understanding is? What does it mean to be bereaved? And absolutely, it impacts us, you know, not just cognitively, not just emotionally, but also physically, spiritually, and sexually. I'm quite keen on sexual as well, I think that's a piece that doesn't get, get addressed. Um, but it's going to be then depending obviously tailor made to the person but I, but I think within this there's, there's some interesting pieces and I hope it will give you something just to, to kind of have a think about if there's someone you're working with of saying what is that stuckness and if we took it to the edge would something like this perhaps uh, move it along ok I seriously have been talking a lot haven't I um, yeah Are you saying someone with complicated grief yeah. or just in, yeah. with, in a regular breathing? No, complicated. Um, Catherine's protocol, I think, allows for about 15 sessions. My experience has been widely different. I mean, sometimes, because I don't always know what's coming in, and, and I get everything from people coming to just know is this okay? Is this normal? I'm going to go crazy. One session. A little bit of work, to like, how can I come up with something so I can take my kids on holidays? To, sorry, what? In two years over time because there's no attachment issue that needs to be dealt with for that um, I, in my own evolving work I'm thinking I'm looking at, at doing the assessment for complicated grief and looking at a tighter protocol around it um, but there's always the alarms that the people come and say well you never believe what happened last week and you're you know, I'm watching that but at least making conscious decisions are we going to be pulled in that direction are we, are we staying with the program? And um, so, where's it's 15? Mine is everything from one to two years. Um, but having, maybe more importantly, is having some marker or, or a place where you're stopping and considering the work together and saying, well, where are we going? Are we getting there? And um, someone said to me this morning, he said, I think I'm going to stop coming here. So I realized I'm always going to miss it. That's not going to change. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So the difference is, do you know how to manage? The bad days, da 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 da. da. Mr. Jack, you said that you can't make me live, miss her death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely not. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. The train is back on the track. Not that the grief is done, but he can do it. Now it's not my business. Mm-hmm. It's lovely when that comes from the client. Sometimes we have to be the ones to start it. And an ending is the opportunity to have a good ending. That again will, will always help. Yeah. Can I just ask you on that, Susan, the apologising of grief? Yeah. That, I mean, again, I work with oncology That's patients, and I it does. you know, we sometimes really have to stress. In fact, we're often it's, it's more our, our it's more you know staff perhaps sometimes more than patients. They actually quite sorry, I'm listening. To be distressed. Yeah. They come in, they're ringing us up, saying, "Oh, you have to see this person. Yeah. They just got this terrible, you know, kind of news." Yeah. And actually, that you know, that distress is actually normal. Yeah. And actually, if they weren't distressed in the situation, mm-hmm. then you should be referring mm-hmm. them to us. But there's yeah. a whole apologising around it now and mm-hmm. of distress. I think that yeah. you know that you know keep, you know this constant move towards counselling, towards mm-hmm. you know you know services. You have to get them into some sort of support group. You have to get them. It, it's just an interesting kind of. Mm-hmm. dynamic to mm-hmm. see that there's this constant yeah. tension about it. I'm feeling very upset so there must be yeah. a pill or yeah. someone to sue or yeah. something to be done yeah. or maybe we just need to sit with it. Yeah. And I'm very uncomfortable because this person is very upset. So Thank I'm you. Somebody else to fix it. Yeah. 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 
You say, I'm talking to someone, and they suddenly say, you should really see someone about that. Yeah. Mm. Oh, sorry, I thought I was talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, certainly in my work, and it's just not sort of what I'm presenting on today, it's the sitting with it, mm. even naming it, you know. Uh, and what does that, and where, you know, what does it feel like? Mm. Where is it? What is it saying? But it's, it's tough grief. And it is not our job to be taking it away from anybody. But certainly I think it's our job to be naming it and calling it what it is and explaining. Mm -hmm. And that assumes that we know then what's a normal grief trajectory, what are the normal symptoms of grief and what isn't. Um, A client said to me once when I was saying, well, you know, grief is different for everybody. We used to think it happened in a very prescribed way, but now it's very unique. It's different, you know, blah, blah. And she said to me, that's really not very helpful. She said, I don't know what I'm doing. Can you give me an emotional banisters? Not a seriously good phrase, you know. And that really is that psychoeducation of thinking. That's fine to say it's different for everyone. Do what you need to do. But how helpful is that when you're in a in a new country and you don't speak the language? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't we have a responsibility to to provide a couple of of markers for people? What can they expect? What is normal and not normal? Mm-hmm. You know. And if you have the positive psychology piece up there. Yeah. I think it's very important to give. You know, it, it can be really hard yes. because there's an expectation that yes. I work with students and yes. this idea that you know anything rough they're not used to. So yeah. you know, there's a yes, our Celtic cubs don't do tough. Well, let's just sit with that. And I would do I would do some meditation in my own practice, and we always would start any client. I would always start with the feet on the floor and the bum on the seat mm-hmm. and sitting with and what comes up. But isn't it curious? You know. We, you know, some of us older people came from it. Well, life is tough, mm. but we've kind of lost that. Yeah. I'm saying it is tough, and grief hurts like hell. Yeah. You know, and it's one it of the things. Like hell, right. Why don't people talk about it? Women say that after their first childbirth. Why did nobody tell me? Mm. Yeah, because it's so hard. It's so awful. You wouldn't want to be telling people. Yeah. Why don't? Isn't it curious how we don't talk about grief, and how something that happens to all of us is such a surprise to people when it happens. Um, and and for us to have the ability to say what you're describing falls within normal grief I'm not saying that's not tough it's terribly tough and you will have good days and bad days but most people find that over time the bad days aren't quite as bad and they start to reconnect you know can we tell people that if that's part of our job and that's a good day's work to get that said yeah. I'm very aware of the time and if you don't mind I just want to mention um, the two bits that we're at yeah the two DSM bits maybe not have a discussion unless people want to be late I, I, I don't know how much people are aware of this raging war at the moment about should what's now being called complicated grief should it be included as, as a disorder and for all those reasons of saying are we medicalizing something and um, be very clear that obviously DSM is the bible in America I worked in the States for years. It has a lot of meaning there that's maybe not the same here in terms of access to service. You know, where the insurance companies will say, well, what's wrong with them? Well, if there's wrong with them, why are you seeing them? Why should we pay for it? Right? So adjustment disorder gets um, quite, an, quite an outing. We don't have that same piece here. But what happens in DSM does filter across. It does have to do with us. Um, Horowitz, another person, a uh, big writer in bereavement, suggested it for the DSM-4 and it was denied to, to be put in as a disorder. They thought there wasn't enough evidence. So that's been a lot of, for example, Holly Prigerson's work since then. And the new criteria now that both Prigerson and Shear and Horowitz most notably have been presenting seems to have held sway and it looks like complicated bereavement will go into the new DSM. Um, that was one battle. Then the next battle is where is it going to go? So as it stands, and I, I was just looking at this last week, the DSM-5, the subgroup, uh, is suggesting that the syndrome of complicated grief go in as a new disorder called bereavement-related disorder, and that it be placed as a subtype of the adjustment disorders. That's one suggestion. Shear et al. Um, are suggesting that a new category Uh, be created called trauma and stress related disorders uh, separate from anxiety disorders and that complicated grief should be placed there Mm -hmm. so 
really what it, 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 I think people now have bought into of saying there is a small percentage people need to have access to treatment for this um, so the argument now is where should it be that's one of them the other argy bargy at the moment is uh, the proposal to remove the exclusionary criterion um, such that depression can be diagnosed within the two months following bereavement now I, I, I don't know how familiar are with this part of the DSM uh, it used to be that you could not diagnose depression two months post bereavement because people felt there was too much overlap between the symptoms and that it was confusing and that we shouldn't be calling something depression if indeed the symptoms could, could be explained through uh, the bereavement that would be noticed on the, or noted on the V code yeah? uh, the suggestion now is that the exclusionary uh, piece be removed so that it could be the idea being that we're more sophisticated now at assessing and that you know the treatment for depression such as antidepressants will only act on the depression not on the bereavement and we may be missing people who are presenting with the depression that need to, to, to be picked up earlier um, so a big row about that lots of letters I referenced ADEC, I don't know if people know the American um, Death Education Counselling. That's a great resource around um, death education stuff. They have quite a few papers uh, around it. Um, so kind of the suggestion from ADEC is that the bereavement exclusion remain with the stipulation that it be revisited pending more, more information. Cathy Shear that I've referenced several times tonight um, is, is arguing as well that it be retained but modified so everybody's kind of weighing in with a different position but I just thought you know for yourselves if, if, if you've either thought about it or haven't been aware of it maybe have a think around where you come down on that and being aware that I know it sort of feels like it's DSM and it's, it's America but it will have implications A what does it mean if we start calling bereavement a disorder a treatable disorder and a diagnosis what's the plus and minus for that and where do you stand on bereavement versus depression um, as separate diagnosis? You know, have we strong enough information around, for example, things like self-esteem, which would be distinguishing factors? Um, plenty to do and think about. Um, I better stop now because I see it's five past seven. Thanks for listening. Good luck. <laughs>